Man. Look at the person next to you and say, the Lord is good. Amen. He is awfully good. I don't know why he loves me so. I don't know why he is so patient. Why he put up with all of my stuff. But I'm thankful. <laughs> I am grateful. And we all can be grateful. I want to ask a question. As believers in Christ, we profess Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of our life. When we ask him to come in and be the Lord and Savior of our life, he indwelled in us his Holy Spirit. Yeah. He filled us with his Spirit. My question is, what does a Spirit-filled believer look like? What does a Spirit-filled believer act like? Paul said, over in Philippians, that a believer, one who walks closely with the Lord, gives the evidence that they are walking with the Lord by the fruit that they produce in their lives. And specifically, he says it this way, being filled with the Spirit, we as believers are to produce fruit of righteousness, yeah. not evil. See, when we're filled with the Spirit of Christ, the only thing that can come to us is that which is good. Amen. That is the fruits of righteousness. I guess it was Monday or Tuesday following the revival, I really sensed something was happening. I really sensed a movement of God that I've not sensed in many a year, amen, uh, in a revival service. Anybody feel that way? I mean, there was something powerful. It really was. For those of you who missed it, you can get the tapes, and God bless you, get the tapes. But it, getting the tapes is one thing. But being in the presence when the Holy Spirit is moving, that's something you can't replicate on any kind of table. I don't care how high deaf it is. Amen? That's a special thing. But Monday or Tuesday after the revival, when I sensed something was really beginning to happen, uh, I, I was reading that passage in Philippians 1.11 where Paul talks about fruits of righteousness, and I began to think about uh, revival. And if revival is authentic, if revival truly does something to us, because see, the prayer was, Lord, come into our hearts and clean us up. And, yeah. you know, uh, we were all about confessing, right? My people will call by my name, would humble themselves and pray, turn from their wicked ways and, and seek my face, then I will hear an answer. Yeah. So that's what we were doing. And, and so if, if we experience something other than just the emotionalism, See, so many equate uh, a revival with emotionalism. See, and I, you know, I'm a very emotional guy. Hello. <laughs> Y'all know that. See, I'm going to get my praise on. I am. <laughs> but, but revival is more than just high emotion. That's right. See, revival results in a real change. All right? And so I'm wrestling with this thing. I said, well, then, what does real revival look like? In other words, what is the fruit that produced by real revival. Well, yeah. And so on that particular day, I suggest, and then I wrote a blog. Uh, I wrote a note on Facebook. Okay, it's on the website. I suggested that, that one of the fruits of real revival is repentance. Yeah. See? If the Holy Spirit has come and, and Brother Abraham really stirred us up, you can't come out of that experience the same way you went into that experience. And so, uh, for me, one of the fruits is repentance, which says that if God convicts me, uh, and if I'm walking closely with him, it's not an if, it's a when. Because if I'm walking closely with him, oh, he will convict me. Because that's the first assignment of the Holy Spirit, is to convict us Amen. Amen. of any ungodly behavior. 
And, and so it dawned on me that walking closer to the Lord, uh, that, that the Lord would convict us, uh, and me in particular, that if I had offended anybody, now y'all know I've been on this apology uh, circuit, okay? I have gone to a whole lot of folks and ask for apology for things I've done to offend. Why? I want to be right. Uh -huh. Is that what did y'all say? I want to what? Be right. Brothers, I need to hear you want to what? Be right. See, and if I want to be right with the Lord, see, I'm now 61 years old. <laughs> I know I look like I'm a smooth 39. I get it. <laughs> it's all right. You know, I turned gray premature, so don't, don't go down the, the hair. But, but I'm... I've come to the realization that I have fewer years before me than I have behind me. Okay? I'm at the place now where the foolishness and all that other stuff that don't matter, I ain't got a whole lot of time for that stuff. So for me now, I just want to be right. Okay? And so being right is making sure that, that if if, you know, I prayed that Psalm 139, if you find any offensive way in me, see, and as God has begun to reveal, well, you know, you said something and didn't go well, so I'm going around and I'm trying to, to uh, get it right with yeah. people. Okay, so one of the fruits of true revival is that if there uh, uh, is a need for uh, seeking forgiveness, if there's a need for repentance, then that will happen. Yeah. So one of the fruits of revival is repentance, all right? Um, one of the other fruits of revival is one I'm going to talk about today, and that is being truthful. Truth, speaking the truth, being honest uh, in all of your ways with people, with spouses, with children, with employers, but more importantly, with God, yeah. okay, is one of the fruits yeah. of real revival. Anybody remember seeing that movie, Jim Carrey, Liar, Liar? <laughs> yeah. That boy lied about everything. <laughs> and his little son pray, uh, 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 had a birthday wish, and his birthday wish was that his dad would stop lying. <laughs> and for a couple of days, the wish came true. The boy couldn't help himself. You know, to tell the truth, you know, wouldn't it be awesome <laughs> if there was a part of us that just, maybe it, you know, whenever we lied, a bell and a whistle went off. Yeah. Our heads illuminated. Well, it don't work that way because God has not created us to be robots. God has given us a free will. And God wants us to respond to him freely with faith and with obedience. But I, I am proposing to you that one of the fruits, one of the uh, results of genuine revival wow. is being truthful. Yes, sir. And so the message this morning uh, is entitled, Truth Matters to God. Yes. Truth matters to God. Yes, it does. God is very serious when it comes to his people being truthful. David in Psalm 51, 6, he says, you desire truth in the inner parts. That's what, that's what David came to realize. Catch that. God is saying, I ain't worried about what rolls off your lips. I really want truth from your heart. See, Isaiah said, about the people speaking for God. He said that the people's lips give me praise, uh -huh. but their hearts are far away from me. Uh -huh. see? Can you see that? With their lips, they, I just want to be right. Yes. <laughs> but their hearts are far from being truthful. Uh -huh. Truth matters to God. Amen? Amen? And so our primary text, and I'm going to have you to stand and read it with me, is found in the book of Acts. Uh, Acts, we're going to read Acts 
uh, chapter 4, beginning at verse 32. And um, I will read, we'll read Acts 4.32 through um, 37 together. And then I will read Acts 5, 1 through 11. Is that all right? So that's the primary text, Acts 4.32 through uh, Acts 5.11. I'll read 5 through 11. Let's read beginning at Acts chapter 4, verse 32. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. And with great power, put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Verse 36, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostle called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, he saw the field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. And in chapter 5, verse 1, now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, was it the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And with great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then the young man came forward, wrapped up his body, carried him out, and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in. Not knowing what had happened, Peter asked her, Tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that's the price. Peter said to her, How could you agree to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they're going to carry you out also. And at that moment, she fell down at her feet and died. Then the young man came in, finding her dead, carried her out, and buried her beside her husband. And great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Speak, Holy Spirit. Speak. Paul in Ephesians 4.25, Paul says, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Truth matters to God. There is a raging debate, particularly among young people, about truth. There are those who would argue that truth is relative. What's true for you ain't true for me. So because that's your value and your belief, you roll with that. But don't impose your value and your belief on me because I don't believe it. See? I'm here to say to somebody, you can believe what you want to believe but Back in the 50s, there was an old television series, and the name of that series was Truth or Consequences. And the way that thing worked was that they had contestants to come out, and they'd give them a series of questions. And if they answered the questions correctly, they got a good prize. If they answered it wrong, they had to pay consequences. And so there's a whole lot of folks who maintain that truth is relative. 
and those very same folks, now or later, well, let me say it this way, sooner or later, they're going to pay the consequences for uh, their error. Amen? Amen? Let me propose to you that truth matters to God from this standpoint. Truth reflects Christ. Truth reflects Christ. See, in the text, Peter says, on the one hand, he says, first of all, you have lied to the Holy Spirit. Then he comes back and he says, you not lied to men, but you lied to God. Well, he's giving us proof right there that the Holy Spirit is God as well. Uh-huh. All right? So truth reflects Christ. All right? He is the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the light. All right? And then the Bible says that when the spirit of truth comes, he's going to guide you in all understanding. All right? So truth reflects Christ. So when we speak truth, we're reflecting the spirit of Christ in us. Right. You got it? Yes. Now, lying, on the other hand, somebody said, oh, lying, lying. rejects truth. Yeah. Lying rejects truth. Yeah. That's a very important concept. All right? Truth, somebody said, leads to heaven yeah. because God is truth. Somebody else says that lying leads to hell because Satan is the father of all lies. So watch this. Truth reflects the spirit of Christ in me. But when I don't speak the truth, when I choose to lie, I am turning my back on truth. And in essence, I am rejecting the Holy Spirit. The Bible says there is only one unpardonable sin. Uh And that's rejecting the Holy Spirit. God takes truth seriously. It's a serious matter. Uh Our fulfillment, our unit has been talking about right living. Amen. Truth matters to God. Repeat that with me. Truth matters to God. On the other hand, lying dishonors God. Not only does it dishonor God, but lying wreaks devastation. Lying wrecks homes. Lying destroys marriages. Lying has been known to split churches. Help me, Holy Spirit. Lying Poisons relationships. Lying breeds distrust. Lying breeds suspicion. How many women have gotten to the place in their marriage where they simply can't trust their husbands anymore? Because Brother Man has said one lie too many. See? Lying breeds distrust. See? And it could be a male or a female. We all lie. (laughs) We all have sinned. Amen? But watch how this thing plays out. Since I said brothers first, I'll pick on the women. (laughs) Uh So sister girl steps out. Says she's going with a sister or a friend to have dinner or something else. And brother man finds out that sister girl had really stepped out. Uh Caught in a lie. Exposed. Uh All right? Uh Well, when you've when you violated that trust, um, um, I'm not going to say it cannot be regained, but that's a tough road to hold. Yeah, that takes a whole lot of time to regain some trust. Yeah. Yeah. And so Sister Girl really goes out with her sister, uh-huh. <laughs> but because lying is bred bread distrust, uh-huh. brother man ain't buying it. No, ain't buying it. Uh-huh. Now tension emerges in the relationship. So the girl is mad because she knows she's right and she was telling the truth, but brother man is suspicious. Uh-huh. Now the relationship is all whacked out. Uh-huh. Amen, somebody? Yeah. Mistrust. Uh-huh. Suspicion.
suspicion, devastation. In our text, somebody said on above. In our text, this is a phenomenal. I mean, this is a, this is just incredible. We see God doing something incredible in the book of Acts. God takes ordinary people and begins to do some extraordinary things in their life. God takes some people who are fearful and, and, and gives them a spirit of, of, of boldness. God takes some people who are weak and all of a sudden they become courageous. God takes people who, 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 who had fear of public speaking and all that stuff and suddenly they're standing toe to toe with, uh, with key leaders. What do we see God doing here in the book of Acts? Uh, when the power of the Holy Spirit came, things began to happen. The Holy Spirit began a process, somebody say process, of spiritual transformation. The Holy Spirit began to work on those hard, stony hearts and began to soften those hearts up. As the people began to submit themselves to the leadership of the Holy Spirit, somebody say submission. See, as people begin to submit themselves to the Holy Spirit, as John the Baptist said, I must decrease so that he can increase. As they begin to humble themselves, submit themselves, the Spirit of God began to rise in them. Rise up in them. And they got real bold. They got courageous. God was building a community of people uh, for himself. And so you see all of the mighty acts. You see how they went out into the, uh, the marketplace and thousands came. You saw how uh, Peter and John spoke to that cripple, healed him. Thousands more came. You remember how they stood toe to toe with the religious leaders who tried to get them to stop talking about Jesus. And they said, you judge whether or not it's right uh, between you and God. But as for us, we're going to keep on talking about the miracles, the power, uh, the change that the Lord has made in my life. Somebody needs to say, I don't care what you say. I'm going to stand on the truth of the word of God. If God said it, I believe it. I don't need to understand it, but I believe it anyhow. Amen. So you see this incredible change. So you come to uh, chapter 4, verse 32, and you see the fruits. You see the fruits of the change. The Bible said those folks were together. They had everything in common. The, and the key to that is they all had one heart and what? One mind. They had the mind of Christ and they had the heart of the Holy Spirit. And that brought them together. And then in the midst of that, Luke, so in other words, everything is going along fine. The church that Jesus Christ planted is beginning to really move forward, all right? Well, uh, in verse number 36, I guess it is, um, the Bible says that, uh, that Luke, uh, he pulls out, he introduces, or he holds up uh, one of those believers. Yeah, verse 36. By the name of Barnabas. Now, Luke could have singled out any one of the believers and said, look, this is what we're talking about. Uh -huh. It just so happens he held up Barnabas. Wasn't nothing special about Barnabas because they all had one heart and one mind. Are you with me? Uh -huh. He holds up Barnabas. Barnabas was a Levite. Barnabas had acquired some property. Barnabas, when he saw the need of the body, Barnabas sold that property. Uh -huh. He got the proceeds and he took it and laid it at the feet of the apostles. Money was divvied up so that needs were met. You guys with me? So what do you see in the church? Can't you see the church is together? They're on one accord. They're clicking. There's a whole lot of love in that fellowship. And Jesus says, it is your love. When people see how you love one another, then they'll know you are my disciples. When people see the love of the fellowship, that's a positive spiritual climate. That attracts people. People want to go into a positive environment. People want to go somewhere where they can be encouraged. Where they can be nurtured. People don't want to go into an environment that all they hear is negative stuff. See? They don't want to go into an environment when all they do is get beat up on. See? Uh, so, so, so as a result of this community that was really in sync, people continued to come to faith in Christ and were added to the church. Oh, look at God. The church is humming along. But then something happens. Anybody know that Satan gets upset 
when God's people are together. Satan gets riled up when things are going smoothly. <laughs> Satan gets angry when people are being healed. My, my. Satan gets mad when strongholds are broken. Right. Yeah. Satan gets angry when people begin to have a sense of confidence, mercy, mercy. assurance, and hope. Oh, he gets fired up then. Satan gets up out of his slumber then. Satan rolls his sleeves up then. Satan has a call meeting of all of his minions. Come on here, boys. On. Like the school tape letters. We got to take, take some action. This ain't good. <laughs> messing up our thing. Because his father liar, this deceiver, is all about destruction. He's all about tearing things apart That's and right. leaving people without any hope. That's right. So Satan doesn't take this thing lightly. Now watch how this thing works. Everything the religious leaders tried to do to stop the movement, when they told them stop preaching, they prayed and became even more bold and more people came. So when they locked them up in jail, they prayed and jail cells opened up all by itself. He said, you can't stop the movement of the Holy Spirit of God. You can't do it. And so, so watch this, watch this, watch this. So Satan tries to attack Mom. from the outside. Yeah. He tries to bring external persecution, but it ain't working. No, it's not working. Because they believed in prayer, uh -huh. and prayer was making a difference. Oh, if Satan can't get you from the outside, <laughs> he'll come at you That's right. from the inside. Mom. Parents, he'll come at you through your children. Mom. Spouses, he'll come at you through your spouse. He'll come at you through your finances. He's going to come at you because him don't quit. Him been defeated. But it's like that snake who's had his head cut off. He's still wiggling and making up some noise. So he comes at you. And watch how he comes at this church. Ananias and Sapphira, husband and wife. They check out this action. They see what Barnabas does. Well, they got some property. They take their property and they sell their property. But the Bible says that they decided, help me Holy Spirit, that they would hold some of the money back and then give the leftovers to the church. Now, the Bible also says that Sapphira was a willing uh, uh, accomplice. That's right. yeah. She went along with this scheme. Bye, bye. Now I know scripture says women that women are to submit themselves to their yes, husband. <laughs> but when it comes to sin, bye, bye. that's where you got to draw a line. <laughs> You draw the line when it comes uh, when your husband or your spouse wants to, to, to do what uh, uh, something that is opposed to the word of God. You know, all bets are off. Submission does not apply when the issue is sin. But she knew it. They go and they drop the money at the apostles' feet. Can you just see? Let's use our imaginations. It's first Sunday. High attendance there. The temple is packed out. Everybody there. And it's time for offering. Everybody comes around and drops their little coins. But there's Ananias waiting until everybody else is gone. And after everybody else has come down, Ananias. Now you would think that Ananias would at that point expect to stay up front where Peter and some of the other apostles would say, Church, Brother Ananias has brought to us a wonderful offering today. Let the church say, Amen. So I can just see Ananias waiting, but that's not what happens. That's not what happens. Peter said, boy. See, he's a part of the fellowship. 
He said, boy, what has happened to you? Quick digression. How did Peter know? The Bible says that the Holy Spirit will give you a discernment uh -huh. where you will know some things before anybody else knows it. Yeah. That's, what the Holy, that's what the Word of God says. Yeah. He, the Holy Spirit will... See, you walk with the Lord. Very few things will call, catch you off guard. I'm t I'm, now I'm speaking from experience. You see, I hear some things and folks bring things to my attention and I just act like this is the first time I heard it. I already know about it. See? Because that's what the Holy Spirit does for those who belong to him. See, you walk with him, he'll give you that discerning spirit. Not only that, he places angels around you. He places people around you so you know everything that's about to go down. That's God. See? And so Peter knew it. He had that discerning spirit, and he looked at the bro, and he said, boy, what in the world has gotten into you? His exact words. He said, look at this. How is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit? And the Bible says that, that right at that point, uh, 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 Ananias dropped dead, the ushers. Hello, ushers. <laughs> Boy, if y'all living back in the day, y'all would have been doing a whole lot of bearing. The folks are lying. <laughs> so the young men come and they take him out unceremoniously. Yeah. See? And just drop that boy in a hole. Three hours later, Sister Girl waltzes in. Oblivious to what's gone down. And then Peter looks at her and says, let me ask you a question, my friend. Is this the amount that you receive for the property. My God. Now, God had given her an opportunity. Yeah. Guys, when opportunities come, a second chance will come, opportunity to, to confess something, right. an opportunity to repent of something, an opportunity to tell somebody you're sorry, My you better take advantage of that opportunity. Because yeah. you don't know when that might be the last opportunity you get. She had an opportunity and she rejected the opportunity. She like, yeah, that's it. I can see Peter now, oh Lord, ushers. Amen. Sister girl, come on, ushers. The same young man that just carried your husband out, come on, ushers, three hours ago, are standing at the door. Immediately she drops dead. They drape her in a shroud and they carry her bad self out and drop her in the ground and go on about their business. Question. Three questions, and I'll take my seat. Why did they lie? Why was the punishment so harsh? A whole lot of folks be lying. And what's the message for us? First question why did they lie? Well, there are those who will say that their sin was the fact that they held money back. And I've heard people try to preach this and, and suggest uh, that, that, you know, when you're not giving God uh, the full tithe, you know, well, okay, 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 but not really okay. You're stretching the text, all right? Um, see, Peter says, hold up here, brother. I know what you did. Now, help me think through this. The property belonged to you. It was your property. And because your name was on the deed, you could do whatever you wanted to do with the property. Uh -huh. That's right. You could keep it or sell it. You decide to sell it. Yeah. And the proceeds from the sale belong to you. Yeah. You had a decision, a choice. It was up to you whether or not you would even give the church anything. Uh -huh. You can give the church 1%, 10 15 all of it. You didn't have to give the church none of it. That's right. Because it wasn't a requirement. So when it was yours, yeah. So in other words, he said, why in the world would you lie? Yeah. His sin was not that he held the money back. Well, His sin was that he lied, oh not to the people, but he lied to God. Yeah. Well, let me go back a notch. Why did he find himself in that position? 
Back in verse uh, 42, the Bible says that all of the people were of one heart and one mind. Uh -huh. yeah. They had the mind of Christ, the heart of Christ. But, but, but Ananias allowed his heart to be filled with an evil spirit. Yeah. Okay. Are you with me? He allowed his heart not to be filled with the spirit of Christ, but with the spirit of the deceiver. Now, this is something where we all have to be careful with. Pain, suffering, disappointment, rejection, uh, unemployment, bankruptcy, yeah. physical illnesses, terminal conditions, divorces, all of that stuff yeah. can beat you down. Yeah. Yes, that stuff can create bitterness in your spirit. That stuff can begin to invade your heart and, and give you a spirit of anger yeah. and resentment. Yes, yes, yes. And that stuff starts building up. Now we know bitterness, envy, jealousy, resentment ain't nothing yes. that comes from the spirit of God. That's right. That's right. Are you following me? Right. But life will begin to take a toll. Life will begin to beat you down. See? And if you aren't careful, see, that stuff will start filling up your spirit yeah. and will have you doing things that you never would have considered doing. Yeah. Somebody will say, I hear, you, I hear you, Pastor. That's why the Bible says, guard your hearts. Guard your hearts. You better protect your heart because out of the heart flows the issues of life. How do you guard your heart? You better stay in that word. You guard your heart by staying prayed up. You, 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 you guard your heart by staying connected to other believers. You see? A lion, when he's on the prowl, he goes after the young ones, the inexperienced, the immature ones. He goes after the weak ones. Those who can't fend for themselves. And he goes after the stragglers. Yeah. Those who are all by themselves. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And my heart goes out to folks who are not in these pews and haven't been in these pews because they've allowed issues of life to beat them down. Yeah. Okay? They're out there by themselves. Yeah. And they're vulnerable. Yeah. So we have some folks who are missing and they got bitterness. Yeah. Oh, I'm on it now. Uh -huh. Ta time to get quiet. We got some folks not here because they're angry. See? They're mad about something. Somebody said something or did something, and they're mad. Oh and I'm going to show you. Uh -huh. That's Ananias. Uh -huh. How in the world uh -huh. could you allow uh -huh. Satan to get in your heart uh -huh. like that? Right. Break it down, break it down. Guard your heart. That's why, that's why scripture is true. If Sister Hoffler has offended me, it's foolish of me to get mad and go off and pout about it. That's not following truth. Truth exists for our protection. The Bible says go to this sister and let the sister know that there's an offense so you can work it out towards the end of the conversation. The unity is protected and preserved. Truth matters to God. It matters to the fellowship. It matters to the body of Christ. Why did they lie? They failed to protect their heart. And because they failed to protect their heart, they were looking for affirmation of people. Because they failed to protect their heart, they were looking for attaboy. Because they failed to protect their heart, they, they, they were looking for the church to stand up and say, Oh, thank you <laughs> for your gift. Uh -huh. But Peter saw right through it. Amen? Uh, my, my. So what's the message here? Well, protect your heart. The message is follow the truth yeah. that's in the word of God. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody receive that? 
second question. Why the harsh treatment? Now, y'all got to admit, this is pretty harsh. Fall dead right there on the spot. Didn't get a chance to say goodbye to nobody. Why? All right, watch God. Watch God. This is so important. Consider what God was doing. God had taken these people and he was changing their heart. God was building a biblical community of loving relationships. That's what he was doing. See? God was transforming hearts so that the hearts of the people would reflect the heart of God. Amen. God was growing the faith experience of a people. Watch this. Growing the faith experience of a people. Okay? The Bible says without faith, you can't please God. Okay? We walk not by sight, but by faith. God, don't you know that faith is critical for our maturity? We have to have faith. And, and in order to get faith, you got to exercise. In order to get faith, you got to step out and put God to the test. Not by sitting back and say, bless me, bless me, bless me, but then I'm faithfully trusting you. And the more you step out, the more you see that God provides for you. Pause. That's why I said, folks, we need to see this $100,000 come together. That would blow us away. But more importantly than that, that will, I think, resurrect, uh, uh, restore, and encourage us for where we got to go forward. Question, can we do it? Absolutely we can do it. How do we do it? By every man and woman just simply trusting God. I'm not talking about how much everybody gives. Just trust God to put it in your heart. Amen. And you as an individual will see God do some things in your life. And we as a community of faith will see our faith grow even higher. So God is building this community of faith. This church, this new church is like a young tree. Amen. A young tree uh, that is very tender, very vulnerable. There was a whole lot at stake. The church was in its formative stages. Y'all give me 10 minutes. Hang in there. The church was in its formative stages. Uh, 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 a very critical time. And, 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 and Ananias and Sapphira, when they see the church growing, when they see people coming, stepping out in faith, saying, I see how they treat each other. I'm going to trust God and experience it for myself. People are coming. Satan works through them for an evil purpose. And when they lied, that endangered, that put at risk, the whole faith community. Somebody says, just a little bit of leaven, just a little bit of yeast will affect the whole batch. My brother has lung cancer. And it's now, I think, stage three lung cancer. It's metastasized and all that crazy stuff. It started with just a little cell. Okay. That's what cancer does. If it's not eradicated, it grows, it consumes, it destroys. So we see that God was acting harshly. Mm -mm. God was acting to protect those who trusted him. Amen. He was acting to protect. Amen. And God acts to protect on our behalf even now. Uh, many, many times the sin of one Christian can have a devastating effect on another Christian. Folks, you better be careful about that parking lot nonsense. You better be careful with that stuff because it's like the seeds getting planted in your spirit. The Bible says that, that uh, if we're going to do anything, let's say words of encouragement. Words that's going to 
uh, uh, edify, build up somebody. Amen? Not bring somebody down. You better watch that stuff. Somebody say, amen, Pastor. I know you're right because that's what the Word of God says. That's truth. A amen? Uh, and, and so Satan be playing this thing, um, and we just got to be careful. That's why Jesus said, if anybody causes one of my little ones to stumble, if anybody does something that causes a new believer to stumble, if anybody does something that, that causes any believer to stumble, to fall, to drift, to leave. If anybody causes that, I ain't said it. Jesus said it. It would have been better. I'm trying to say truth matters to God. It would have been better if he had or she had a millstone around their neck. And like the mafioso would do, throw that bad boy over into the depths of the sea. Say, God, that's pretty cruel. God takes truth seriously. Amen. Hypocrisy is a destructive force within the community of God's people. His hypocrisy, pretentiousness, that's what they were doing. They were pretending. Yes. Pretending to be something they really were not. They were fronting. They were masquerading. They were walking around trying to appear holier than they really were. Yes. Hypocrisy creates impression. They were given all that they were really pious. They were really spiritual. Again, this is Satan's uh, move to corrupt, corrupt the church from the inside. Does God take truth seriously? Yes, he does. Why? Because it's his church. It's the church he bought, purchased, paid for with his blood. It's a priceless thing. The church, not the building. The people are priceless. They are expensive. It's too expensive to fool around with. God hates sin in the church if for no other reason than just for the fact that it cost him yes, yes. to buy his church. Oh my goodness, I'm almost done. Well, what's the message for us? What's the message? Several messages. The one I really like is that uh, when I look at this, they were a perfect church, perfect church through four chapters of Acts. But then we get to chapter 5, all of a sudden you see uh, sin coming into the church. All of a sudden you see the beginning of what would go on to become uh, a plague in the church. Uh, you see the genesis of what in many sad instances has killed churches throughout history and that is the sins of the saints. But you know what I like about the word of God? God don't, don't, don't mix any punches. God don't just paint a nice little rosy picture to have us to think that all churches have been perfect. He don't paint a nice picture that all the heroes of the faith all the sheroes of the faith were perfect people. Those folks were messed up. Amen? Amen? Uh, 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 there were hypocrites in the church. People are real quick to say the reason that they don't go to church is because there are too many hypocrites. And I feel like saying well, there's always room for another one. Always been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why it's a hospital for folks who are sick. At least we know we're sick and we come to where we can get healed through the Word of God. <laughs> oh Lord, help me, Jesus. But, but just consider this. I'm sitting up here saying, oh, Lord, sometimes a senior pastor green for us. Lord, is it me? Lord, have mercy. Lord, what am I doing wrong? But then I see this. 
Then I, I see Paul, and I think about Paul. Uh, Paul never wrote, mm, help me Jesus, one letter in the New Testament that he was not saying something about some mess in a church somewhere. Oh, y'all stay with me. Don't get mad. Stay with me. There's truth in the text here. In Romans 16, 17, he, he, he says, I beseech you, brothers. Uh, 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 I beseech you, brothers. Mark uh, uh, between those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to what you already have learned right there in Romans. In Corinthians, he said, I cannot even speak to you as spiritual. I got to talk to you as cardinals. When you should have been eating meat, all you could take is milk because y'all always fighting with each other. He said that in Corinthians to the Ephesians. He said, come on now, people walk worthy of that in which you've been called to. Y'all need to humble yourselves, do all you can to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace because y'all got some mess going on up in there. Woo, Jesus. And then in the third chapter, I'm feeling good now. In the third chapter of, of Colossians, he cites a list. Now we're going back to 33 AD, 45 AD. He cites a list of sinful behavior in the church. He said, y'all lying. Y'all using bad language and cursing. You are slandering each other. There are conflicts between members and there's a lack of forgiveness. And then even among uh, uh, the biblical characters, Abraham was a liar. Noah was a drunk and an exhibitionist. David was an adulterer. Jacob was a schemer and a deceiver. Jeff Samson couldn't keep his pants on. Uh, uh, God just exposes the church. As it is. But the good news is that what we've gone through, God can bring us out of. Amen? He can bring us out of. He can bring it, us to it. And so that's what we see here in Acts chapter 5. The seedings of sin that the church would be having to deal with for the rest of its experience in this life. The same things, guys, that we're having to deal with even today. The Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. Tell you a funny joke. I mean, not a joke. It's a fact. Uh, when Anthony Henry's father died, we went down to Columbus, Mississippi to the funeral. And uh, his dad was a chairman of the deacons uh, and was so known in that community that uh, a lot of preachers came out, pastors. There was 10 pastors in the pastor's office where Reverend Cody and I were. And so I was talking to one guy who was like, had been pastoring for 29 years. I said, man, I'm sure you've seen a whole lot of stuff. Down through the years, he said, yeah. He says, but boy, in these fast few years, I ain't never seen no stuff like this. <laughs> I said, really? And so they had a, the, the cemetery on the campus, and we walked down and laid his father to rest. And I'm walking back with this 81-year-old pastor who'd been pastor about 40 years. And I said, I thought you'd seen, I bet you'd seen a whole lot of stuff. He said, Reverend, I don't think I can take no more of this stuff. <laughs> so I started laughing. And he said, well, why are you laughing? I said, man, I thought it was just me. <laughs> Uh-uh, folks. Uh, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Okay? From day one, it's been this conflict in the cosmic between Satan and God, the master deceiver. So it ain't, all I'm trying to say, it ain't new. But we've got to protect ourselves and guard our hearts so we don't get sucked in it. Amen? So we don't get sucked in it. Well... Uh, let, me, let me bring this to a conclusion. Um, what is the message here? Well, part of the message is that it's nothing new here, okay, but God expects us to really represent him. Uh, um, uh, in this text, if you think about it, this text is really a warning. It's a warning for us, okay? Uh, a warning that we must be on guard against the work of Satan in our midst. When those two drop dead, God's warning to us is that he takes sin seriously. Every time you think that they drop dead, should remind us that God 
takes trust seriously or truth seriously especially uh, in the lives of believers who've been filled with the Holy Spirit. There's no excuse for us to lie. Amen. Not only does he hate sin, but God punishes sin. Peter says in 1 Peter 4, 17, that the judgment must begin at the house of God. Amen. Amen. So, God hates sin. God punishes sin. And then thirdly, be careful that you don't presume on God's mercy. Amen. What do you mean, Pastor? Be careful that you don't presume on God's patience. Pastor, what are you saying? Be careful that you just don't assume you're going to have time to get right with God. Don't assume you're going to have time to be reconciled with a brother or sister. Okay? Um, We've got to act when we hear the word of God call us. Amen? Amen. There are moments of truth that come in our lives. One of the moments of truth is when that offering basket comes down your pew. It's a moment of truth. God expects us to trust him. We sing all of those songs, I surrender all. Wherever he leads me, I will follow. The people praise me with their lips, but their hearts. So one moment of truth, knowing that God calls us to tithe and to trust him, is when you got that offering basket. See, that's your moment of truth. Are you trusting God? Or are you just dropping the change that you have in your pocket? That's a moment of truth. God takes truth seriously. Another moment of truth is going to come up on next Sunday when we bring this communion table out. Okay? That's a moment of truth. Because he says if you have any kind of a conflict with anybody, don't touch that. See? Leave it alone and go and get that matter taken care of. He says in Corinthians 11, For this reason, many of you come and you eat and drink in an unworthy manner. And in doing so, you're eating and drinking judgment unto yourself. But see, we do it and don't think about it because we become so casual. Because there's not an instant consequence of our decisions. But sooner or later, one way or the other, there will be a consequence for our sins. Amen? Amen. Amen. If God has put it in your heart to go to somebody and get it straight, don't put it off. Don't presume on God's patience of Amen. What is truth? That was the question that Pilate asked. What is truth? Truth is not a verbal proposition. Truth is a person. Jesus, the Bible says, came to earth full of grace and truth. To know Jesus is to know truth. To follow Jesus is to follow truth. To believe in Jesus is to believe the truth. To love Jesus is to love the truth. Truth matters to God. I'm finished. <laughs> truth matters to God so much that he sent his only son into the world to become the way, the truth, and the life. It matters that much. That he allowed his son to be hung high and stretched wide. He allowed his son to be crucified, to die on the cross. Because truth matters that much to God. They took his body down. They buried him in a borrowed tomb. He was there all Friday night. Come on, y'all, all Saturday night. 
But because truth is important to God, early Sunday morning, with all power in his hands, he conquered sin and death. He paid the price for our sins. He became our substitute because truth really matters. And because truth matters, every word of God, we can trust it. Amen. When God says, I, uh, uh, I'm an ever-present heaven to time and need, call on him. And he'll answer you. Because uh, a truth matters to God, you can trust God's word. When he says that I, that, that, that I will never leave you nor forsake you, he'll be right there with you. It's true. Amen. Because truth uh, matters to God. When God says there ain't no weapon formed against you, it's going to prosper. You can hold your head up in confidence because he's going to take care of it. But because he said that all have sinned and fallen short of his glory. Because he said the wages of sin is death. That's true. What are you saying? Anybody that does not have a personal relationship with me, your destination is hell. But his great truth is that he loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever, this is the truth, whosoever, it doesn't matter what you've done. It don't matter how messed up your life has been. The truth is whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Here's a moment of truth. Do you know for certain that when you die, if you were to drop dead like Ananias and Sapphira, do you know for certain that when you wake up, you will be in the presence of God. If you've not confessed your sins, if you've not asked him to come in and be the Lord of your life, then you're out there on a hope and a wish. But the good news is that this is an opportunity for you to come. So if you're here this afternoon, you've not accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, ain't nothing to be embarrassed about. This is an opportunity to rejoice because this is the day of your salvation. And we invite you to come Slip up out of your pew. If you want somebody to come with you, ask them to walk down with you. Let us stand. The doors of the church are open.